Okay, I'm about to give birth wow. and awesome. you've done this three times. This yes, is my third. I have. I'd love to just hear like, how yeah. do you do what you do? For you produce too. a show four days a week. Yeah. And, and you produce it. Like, it's not like someone's giving you a script. Do and you, you have a thousand episodes, right? Almost a thousand episodes. A podcast four times a week is a lot. It's mostly because I love it. Like, it is my professional baby. The thing that takes longer in parenting, I've realized, is typically the right thing mm -hmm. to do. Like, inviting kids into your mission, they yeah. are going to slow you down. Everything will bend to what our family needs. Every season is different and God really does supply the wisdom and grace you need for every stage. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today, we're going to be talking with my dear friend, the lovely Allie Beth Stuckey of the very popular podcast, Relatable. We're going to have a great conversation about motherhood, how we do it as mothers who are working to also be the best mothers we can be. We talk about her perspective and approach to what she talks about on her show, how it's been so effective, especially among younger women, and so much more. I hope you enjoy this episode. And as always, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. GoodRanchers.com is American meat delivered. Did you know that 90% of the meat in your grocery store doesn't come from the United States, even if the meat packages say product of the USA on it? That's a little trick that a lot of meat manufacturers use as they import it from other countries and then they can slap on product of the USA. Not so with Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is sourcing 100% of its meat, poultry, pork, and seafood products directly from US ranchers. And you can tell by the products. The beef is just better. The chicken is delicious. You're not going to find chicken like Good Ranchers chicken at the grocery store. Usually it's stringy or it's rubbery. It's not as flavorful. Good Ranchers chicken is delicious. Good Ranchers also has a very special deal going on right now that if you order a subscription box of meat and chicken, you will get free chicken for an entire year, an additional two plus pounds of chicken per box. You can get that great deal by using the code Lila at checkout at goodranchers.com. Check them out. You won't regret it. That's goodranchers.com. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for a year's supply of free chicken. Allie, thanks for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you out I here. I know, me too, me too. I just had a great conversation with you over at the live action space. Yes. And we talked about IVF. Yep. Abortion. All the women, controversial things. The yeah. controversial things. So we're going to still go controversial with this Let's episode. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's I'm our ready. job, right? To I'm talk ready. about the tough stuff. Yes. But um, also the fun stuff. So maybe, okay, I'm about to give birth. Yes, you and are. Oh my gosh, you're so close. You've done this three times. This yes, is my third. I have. Maybe let's just start there. Give me yeah, some advice. Let's talk about your... birth. Okay, I actually <laughs> love talking about birth. Not everyone talks or loves talking about birth as much as I do. And so I have to temper it a little bit. And also I follow like a lot of birthing and pregnancy accounts on Instagram. And so I think that has made like desensitized me a little bit in that most people see it as like a graphic process that they don't really want to discuss explicitly. So I will try to temper my language about birth, but I love birth. Just go full. I Just love, go raw, be raw. I, I Molly. love pregnancy and I love to talk about people's birth. So I want, well, I want to hear, have you, have you told your birth stories for your first two? I don't think I have. Okay, can so you give I think me like I, a summary? I think I will though once this baby comes because okay. I wasn't really doing regular podcasting with the other ones. Yeah. So there wasn't really a vehicle yet. Did those births go well? Everything was all good? I mean, overall, you know how it goes. Like there, were, I did not do C-sections. They were natural or they Which were vaginal great. births. Yeah. And then the first one was, you know, unnatural. No little, no little anythings. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty intense. And then the second one, I'm like, give me the epidural. Wait, the first one you didn't have an mm -hmm. epidural? How big was he? He was seven, seven, seven. Okay. So the like second one was size. eight, yeah. eight, six, eight, 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 seven, yeah. seven, and eight, eight. Oh my goodness. My second was eight, eight, two. That's a nice yes. little number. Yes. Okay. Wow. I am so impressed that you gave birth without an epidural. Yeah. I mean, my <laughs> mother did that eight times. Yeah. So I like, know. that's my, that's my legacy or my, that's my it's example. Totally possible. Totally doable. And my mother-in-law did that eight times. Yeah. Wow. So that was like the thing. Everyone did it without epidurals in their day. So yeah. when I had that as my going off, I was like, well, I have better. Not, yeah. not that it was a point of pride, but I kind of wanted to give it a shot. Yeah. And there's obviously there's some, some potential issues with epidurals. Right. Mm -hmm. And you did it. Yeah. 
The second one, you had an epidural. Yeah. And that's great too. It was I would no love, judgment. <laughs> yeah, no judgment at all. I think that there, I mean, there are risks to epidurals. I wanted to, so this time for me was a VBAC after two C-sections, which that's is- That's impressive, Allie. It's, it's difficult to find a provider that will do that because there are some risks associated with it, like uterine rupture, um, but it's a very small percentage. And so if you have a provider that knows- the risks, but also the benefits because there's a lot of benefits to vaginal birth and there are risks to repeat C-section. So I wanted to give it a shot and I was in a hospital setting and with very supportive providers and nurses and everything. And I really wanted to have the natural, no epidural birth because sometimes an epidural can slow down Mm -hmm. birth. And I just really wanted to avoid a C-section. Um, and so I didn't avoid the epidural altogether, but I did wait till seven centimeters. Whoa. And that was, I That's was almost avoiding almost, almost. And maybe I could have, but honestly, after I got the epidural, things just went so much more quickly you after that, more. that I'm yeah. thankful for it. I'm so thankful for it. I know that there are risks and there are reasons why people don't get epidurals and I am like more power to you. I respect that <laughs> for me. I love an epidural. I feel like it is the common grace of God <clears throat> given to us through medicine. And I can't say that about all medicines, but the epidural was a game changer. I was like a new woman. I had been for, you know, my entire labor, just prostrate. Like this is the worst thing. This is so painful. I got an epidural. I was like ready to chat. I was ready for dinner. I was ready for like, how long after the epidural to the birth? Like an hour. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And so that you was needed great. that. I'm doing a VBAC after C-section, yeah. two of them. Yeah. You know, you need it. You, I'm surprised you made it that far without one. I know. Well, you know, so. I don't know if all hospitals offer this, but I had basically what's like laughing gas, mm. nitrous. I don't know if Did that work. Was, Yes, until things got really intense. Did you laugh? <laughs> no, I did not. I was okay. not laughing. It was still really painful, but mm-hmm. it kind of numbs you or it puts you in a different headspace. And so if you want less intervention, but you still need some pain management help, then that is a good option. I don't know if every hospital offers it, but I had that. And then I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm dying. And I got the epidural and it was all good. And I'm, I'm so thankful for it. I just wanted mm-hmm. the option to be able to have more kids. If the Lord blesses us with more kids and the more C-sections you have, the more complicated it can be. And so having a VBAC just gives me a better possibility of having an uncomplicated future pregnancy and birth. So yeah, I'm so thankful for it. Every morning when I wake up, I love to make myself a steaming cup of Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is gourmet, small batch, low acid, ethically sourced coffee that is absolutely delicious. I love the Burundi blend and the Ethiopian medium blend. So many different choices at sevenweekscoffee.com. What I love about Seven Weeks Coffee is not just that it's delicious coffee delivered right to my door, but that Seven Weeks Coffee fuels the pro-life movement. In fact, Seven Weeks' mission is to give 10% of all of its revenue, not just its profits, directly to support pregnancy resource centers. In fact, Seven Weeks Coffee has already supported 800 pregnancy resource centers, helping moms and babies in need, and donated over $325,000. At sevenweekscoffee.com today, you can join the Heartbeat Club where you can get the lowest prices and the best discounts on your monthly subscription. You'll get 15% off a month, and when you use my code Lila at checkout, you'll get an additional 10% for 25% off your first order. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, Order yourself an amazing subscription of coffee, try out your favorite blend, and get 25% off your first order by using the code Lila at checkout. Okay, so what I love about you, besides all the public work that you're, you do, is that you're also a devoted Christian, you're a devoted mom, you're a devoted wife. I'll just say your baby and your very sweet husband and your mm-hmm. adorable baby are over in the other room, yeah. and we were just talking <laughs> about like managing our lives before we started the podcast and how this all goes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'd love to just hear, like, how do you, how yeah. do you do what you do? And I'd you, love to hear you, that from you, you produce too. a show four days a week. Yeah. And, and you produce it. Like you, I mean, you have a team, but you are, you know, it's not like someone's giving you a script. Right. Right. Um, I do, and you have a thousand episodes, right? Of almost a thousand episodes. I That's, do. I'm only at like almost a hundred and it's. 
it's a lot. It, it, <laughs> it, it is like a lot. It is a lot. And even I have an awesome team and I have a mm-hmm. producer and I'm so thankful for them. And I have help with research. That hasn't always been the case though. Like before I had kids, when Relatable started in 2018, I was not only, you know, preparing everything like the script or the research and the subjects and the planning and all of that and the posting and the cutting, but I was also like uploading the audio on my own and I was like (laughs) posting it. I was doing all of that. And so, and that in addition to, you know, beat bopping around the country, trying to speak to different colleges and things like that and trying to do a bunch of interviews. I mean, I was just able to. I had the time to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. And then as the show has grown, but also as I've had three babies since 2018, we've added more and more people. And I wouldn't be able to balance it all without the relatable team that's there. And really just, I would say just this year, as my husband has stepped in to help a lot more with helping manage me and manage our business and work together, we've realized how many more helping hands we actually Mm -hmm. need to like push what I'm doing in the right direction and consistent direction. And so um, I think that just how we're able to balance all of it, not that we do it perfectly is with a lot of help. Even then, you're right. A podcast four times a week is a lot. I've missed a lot of book deadlines, um, said no to a lot of writing opportunities, had to put off other kind of opportunities because the podcast comes first. And it's mostly because I love it. Like it is my professional baby. It is my labor of love, a thousand episodes. And that is, you know, uh, more than a thousand hours because some of my episodes are long, but behind that are many, many more hours that go into the preparation then go into the posting and all of that. And so, um, yeah, I'm very like protective of it and I'm very thankful for it, but it is how I channel all of the angst and all of the questions and all of the passion that I have, uh, in what's going on with the world. And so, yeah, it it means a lot to me. Never as much as the higher things in my life, but it's important to me to find a way to continue to do it. Cause at least for now, I feel like it is what primarily professionally anyway, way beneath my family, um, God has called me to do. So it's a calling. Yeah. And there have been different, you know, I'm sure yours is the same way, like different Mm -hmm. seasons where I feel like my husband and I have done it well, where we've balanced really well saying yes to the right things and saying no to the right things. And other seasons where we haven't, where I look back and I'm like, we said yes to way too much then. What were we thinking? Or we said, uh, we probably shouldn't have said no, or we didn't have to say no to Mm -hmm. those things. Or we could have figured out a way to include all of us in that. I feel like, you know, six years into the podcast, we are just now really like hitting our stride and figuring out how to balance everything. Um, And so, you know, by the grace of God, we'll just continue to do that and hope for the discernment to say yes at the right times and no to the right things and too. The, and the driving heart behind Relatable from what I see looking in is you see the chaos out there and the confusion and God's given you these talents and so you're offering them through yeah. this format to direct people. Is that yeah. kind of the North Star with yeah. it? Yeah, that I mean, that's exactly right. I use those words chaos and confusion a lot. I try to bring clarity and courage to a culture that is filled with chaos, confusion, and cowardice. And you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, I just feel a pull every day to do it. Now there are days where it's tiring. There are days when I don't want to do it. There are days when I'm disheartened, when I'm discouraged. And I'm like, are things ever really going to change? Does anyone care? Like, is anyone out there? Am I just like, you know, yelling into the wind? Do you really feel that sometimes that, oh, is anyone listening? Because you clearly have a lot of people listening. Yes, but... Like you can go to your downloads page probably, right? And your YouTube views and be like, well, at least people are watching this. Or does it feel like there's just yes. not enough of them watching? Well, you know, 
both of us have a certain amount of followers and a quantifiable, I guess you could say impact or footprint, but then you look at the way the world is going or a new issue comes up and you're like, really Christians are confused about this. Christians are too scared to talk about this. Christians don't know the answer to this or the election went this way. Really? And you're like, okay, does it even matter. Of course it does because it's not about that. It's for it's about glorifying God by obeying him and being faithful. Um but of course it can feel it can feel discouraging and disheartening when it just seems like the world is continuing to spiral. And if you take yourself off the if you bench yourself, you know, and all those things can they everything can always get worse. <laughs> it yes. can, but it can get better. That's, That's the true. beauty of it. That's true. But we don't want it to get worse and we want it to get better. And yeah. God can do anything. I mean, that's what totally. always I've seen it. I've seen God just work miracles mm-hmm. in all kinds of situations. And I'm I w I'm I'm waiting and praying for it as I know you are to happen on the macro mm-hmm. as yeah. well as the micro. And it has historically happened in the micro or in yeah. the macro, excuse me. Both, yeah. God changing the course of human history for better. Yeah. So tell me, I'm curious, how how do you balance it? Because you've been mm-hmm. running this organization for a really long time, longer than I've been in the game. And like, this is yours. I would say mm-hmm. even more than like relatable is mine. Live action is yours. And this has just come from like, your heart for unborn children. I mean, you run a, like a really huge organization in addition to this podcast and so many other things and you have three beautiful kids. And so how do you balance I'm, it all? I'm telling me how you do it. <laughs> Give me advice. I mean, I'm, it's figuring it out. It's working, you know, working as I go, but live action is not mine. I, and that's the thing, like early days. Yeah. I would be the one staying up all night, pulling the all nighters. Kind of like you're describing early days of relatable, I think. Yeah. And that's with start, you know, usually any kind of bootstrap startup, it requires like 150% of you and you stretch to the margins and then some, but now live action, we've got a staff of over 40 people. That's not including our contractors and our part-time. We've got an amazing executive team. We've got an amazing board, you know, I've got an amazing staff and they're doing amazing things. And so over the years I've learned to just, you know, basically uh, select myself out of a job with most of the jobs I used to do. So I'm only doing the things that I can most, most contribute and best contribute. And now there's an amazing team that are better than I am at so many other things. And it's the only way we're able to make the impact we are able to make. Yeah. So that really is it. And, you know, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't be able to be the mother and the wife that I feel called to, and you're called to, um, in the early days, live action, right? You know, so it's like the, it's a timing thing. Yeah. And then with the totally. podcast, you know, having certain structures set up in advance before even launching this podcast, so that I'm not the one pulling the all nighter, posting it. Frank, <laughs> I know yeah. we have other people who, who you know, who do stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that is again the reason that it's able to happen. So. I think there's a season for these things and totally. then it requires it's all, you know, and I, I know you've seen this in the comment section where it's like, cause I don't know how much you've talked about this on your show, but I, on the show recently, we've talked more about like stay at home moms and you know, what young, very young children need in terms of not just quality, but quantity time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've had some people in the comments be like, you know, hypocrite, you know, yeah. you're, you're working this you're corporate job. Boss, and yeah, yeah I, I, in some ways, yes, but I do, I would not survive in a law firm. I would not survive in investment Same. banking with the kinds of hours and the format of hours that are required. I do put in a lot of hours, but I can do them at night. You know, yeah. I can do them at nap time, but there's a flexibility with how I do things. And there's an expertise I've developed in how I can do the thing mm-hmm. over the last two decades, really, so that I can contribute and be able to make a difference in the work and lead while still not compromising core things with my kids. And that's a privilege. Like I'm not going to pretend like every woman has that opportunity and it takes a certain trajectory to get to that place of opportunity. Um, And I'm, I feel extremely grateful that that's where the Lord has me at this time. Yeah. And that's the same for me too. And that is the wonderful thing about having the kinds of jobs that we do. And like you said, I understand not everyone can do that, but you know, we are essentially kind of our own bosses Mm -hmm. and I can dictate my schedule. There are times when, I mean, of course, if I couldn't come in that day and do my podcast, then I wouldn't come in. We have a ton of like pre-recorded content that we've done over the years that we put out sometimes. And really like it is kind of a balancing act, but people don't see all of the teamwork that goes into producing it. And in this season, like you just articulated, 
Like it's not me sitting for eight hours a day or even six hours a day, typically like sitting at a computer. That's just not how it is. I get to go in and record my podcast in the morning and then I get to go home. And um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's definitely uh, interwoven into our lives what we do, or at least like what I do, what my family does. Um, And my kids come along with me and my parents also, I mean, they live a mile from us. And that's so awesome. Yes. We all support one another, but I spend so much time. I'm so thankful for that. I spend so much time at home and so much time with my kids. And I'm so thankful that in this season, I'm able to do both, but it does mean saying no to some things. Like I don't do the interviews all the time. Like I used to, I'm not waking up for Fox and friends first. Like I'm just not, I'm just saying no to that. I'm sorry. That's 3 a.m. in California. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Like yeah. I'm just, I'm saying no to those mm-hmm. interviews. I'm not like just traveling to any mm-hmm. college that like wants me to come speak. I'm not, I'm not hustling. You're like, it's just, just different. It's different. I say no to a lot more things than I used to. And I focus mostly on relatable and then taking the opportunities that I really care about. And we do it together as a family. And it's really like, it's a really beautiful thing. It's really rewarding, but only how do you discern what to say yes and no to, especially as your kids, you have more kids yeah, and they need different things from you as they grow. Yeah. Right. So like taking the newborn with you and you've got one child, it's kind of like, they just, they just come with me out there at the interview, do the interview. I'm going to go nurse them in the green room, but now there's a two-year-old at home Mm -hmm. and now there's a four-year-old and the four-year-old needs different things from the two-year-old. I think yours are maybe one year older than mine. Mm -hmm, I think so. Um, You're like a little bit ahead on the, on the trajectory, but how do you make those decisions? What does that decision-making process look like, especially with your husband? Mm. Yeah, we look holistically at our schedule. What's going on? We're not doing like I was used to be able to do before kids back to back. Oh, I need to be in three different cities in one week. No problem. Like we'll just jet set and do that. Mm. That's just not what we're doing. We look at the organization. We look at the mission. We look at what the whole opportunity is, the time commitment that it's going to be. Like, for example, I'm here less than 24 Mm -hmm. hours. It could be fun to make a weekend in Southern California, but that's, you know, that's just not, that's just not what we do. Um, And so, and sometimes it becomes like a whole family trip. Um, Disneyland, (laughs) if you still do Disneyland. Right, right. Um, SeaWorld. Yeah. (laughs) So like, for example, I, we decided to do this because I believe in the mission of live action Mm -hmm. because you're a friend and because schedule wise, like we could make it work. And so, yeah, we're looking at a lot of different factors. And of course, if there's ever any commitments that we have with our kids for whatever reason, that always comes first, no matter what. And I'm just so thankful that I do have a job where at any moment I can drop everything and I can go do what I need to do. And I do, I do. That's what that looks like for me. Um, And it sounds like you're with them because of your show schedule. It's not like they're, you know, handed off to, you know, there's no daycare involved. There's no, you're handing them to someone, people you trust, and you're doing it for a pound of time that you're able to get your work in. And then you're with them a lot of the day. Is my understanding. Oh yeah, you, I'm with them basically all day, except yeah. for when I'm actively, you know, recording my recording my. That's podcast. such a blessing. But yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a blessing. So we figure it out. We figure it out as you are too, and maybe the next season will look different because you know we're not in the season yet of school, um, and we're still figuring out what exactly that's going to be. And obviously, if we are full time homeschooling, which I don't know, if if we is that will on or the not, horizon possibly. Um, Possibly. And I think it'll depend on each Mm -hmm. child too. And, you know, all my kids have different personalities and they have different strengths. And so we'll figure out what that looks like. I mean, definitely it's going to be Christian education no matter what. For us, public school is just not an option that we have on the table. But whether that'll be homeschool, whether that'll be a hybrid, whether that'll be a Christian school. I went to a Christian school kindergarten through 12th grade and I'm very thankful for that. But that's going to you know, determine also what my work looks like and what the show looks like and everything will bend to, you know, what our family needs. And so every season is different and God really does supply the wisdom and grace you need for every stage. And it's such a privilege and a blessing. I know I experienced this to have the ability to do bending, meaning, you know, say no to something, say yes. I know, again, there's women who are not in that position, or especially if like they're the sole breadwinner for whatever reason, where they have to sort of answer to certain demands that they feel are not conducive to family. So there's so many different 
variations of this. And I think having this conversation is valuable that, though to say that, you know, we can have our experience and our trajectories, but the, at the end of the day, the point is priorities and working towards those priorities. And for you mm-hmm. and for me, it's like the family that has to be the first priority. Yeah. And that's not just for women. That's for men too. Yeah. I think it looks different though for young mothers Yeah, because of the, the amount your, your babies need and deserve you. Mm-hmm. And I've heard you talk about before, and I think that this is really insightful. These like this black and white binary of stay at home mom versus working mom, they're not really real categories because there are a lot of moms who say that they're stay at home moms and they are because they're at home, but they've got their Etsy shop or they're making money somehow uh, online or through social media, or maybe they're knitting or maybe they're selling sourdough bread or something. So (laughs) they are industrious and working Mm -hmm. and bringing in an income in some way, even though they are stay at home moms, you could also say that they are working moms. They are working in some way by bringing in that money, but they are also at home. And I think as you have said mm-hmm. to me, like throughout history, there has typically been that kind of combination of yes, prioritizing the home, prioritizing children while still being industrious and even entrepreneurial, which is very different, I think, than the structure of, okay, dropping your kids off at daycare mm-hmm. at 7 a.m. and, you know, being in corporate America until 6 p.m. There is a difference there. I know maybe for some single moms, that's what they have to do necessarily, but there's a difference, I think, in like building the family economy, um, prioritizing your home while still being entrepreneurial in some way, and the girl boss culture of handing off your kids and, you know, pursuing some title at a marketing firm. Totally. As I've shared on the show before, I'm very picky about my skincare routine. In fact, I've tried many products over many years and never landed on a product line, a brand that I really love. And then I discovered NimiSkincare.com. That's N-I-M-I skincare.com. Nimi Skincare is a company that shares our values. It's pro-family and pro-life, but it also is a high quality, clean skincare brand based on decades of research. They use clinically proven ingredients and they've got incredible products. Go to NimiSkincare.com today. Check out their lines. I love how simple the products are to use. I love that the ingredients are clean. I really enjoy the hydration cream as well as their brightening sunscreen that I use every single day. I know you or the woman in your life will love their products. So go to NimiSkincare.com today. Use the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order. That's NimiSkincare.com and you can use the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper company, and they're also America's pro-life diaper company. These products are high quality premium baby products that are great for your little one's skin. And they also support the pro-life movement by donating money back to support mothers and babies in need. You can join a subscription service and get your diapers and wipes sent directly to your door. Check out their products. They're awesome. They're better than Pampers or Huggies or these competitors. And Pampers and Huggies and many of these competitors are pro-abortion companies that support abortion. Every Life, on the other hand, has awesome products at a great price point and supports our values and supports children. So go to everylife.com today. You can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order and get the best products for your little one. That's everylife.com. And one thing that I've... I I was actually, when we were talking earlier um, about womanhood and feminism for life action, I was thinking about... And, you know, we were talking about the statistic of some women increasingly don't want to have kids. There's this whole concert of women that don't want to have kids. And that's a bigger group, young women, it's a bigger group than men that don't want to have kids. So they just don't, the idea of having a child is, goes against just their desires at a very innate level more than historically. Mm -hmm. And I think that we were talking about why that was, but one other thing that I was thinking that we didn't discuss, but makes sense here to talk about is mother wounds or just being out of touch with being able to get down at a kid's level and want to nurture a little one. And uh, there's this woman, Erica Commissar, who talks about this mother wound where if you weren't mothered as a child and you didn't have the experience of a mother delighting in you and being present to you emotionally and physically, it's hard for you to live that with your kids, future kids potentially, Mm. or even want that with future kids. Have you come across that? And what is your, what's your take on that? Hmm. I think that that's probably true. Although I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who would say that they're the exception to that. Of that, course. You know, it's you for know, there's, some there's women. always, for there's, some. yeah, there's always exceptions to that, but I would say that's probably true as a general rule. It's probably true also 
for fatherlessness, I think it can be difficult for men who don't have the example of a father to then fulfill that role. It's probably also true of mothers as well. Um, But that does make me think of a debate that I saw on Twitter that I'm curious what you think about this. Okay. So this, like, yes, you're talking, I did not enter this debate, but I was just watching it. (laughs) I know that's that's a whole other discussion, which Twitter debates to enter and which, which to not. Oh, we should talk about that. But Like, I don't even think it was conservative versus liberal, but this speaking about like being present with your kids and engaged with your kids, um, one woman was saying how this pressure to be constantly engaged with her kids, like constantly playing with them, constantly on the floor with them, constantly parenting. To some degree. Maybe, maybe, like constantly talking to them. Well, completely in tune with your child's emotional state. I, well, it's my impression even, of yes. part of gentle parenting. Anyways. Yes. I think she's just talking about literally like just always feeling like she has to entertain them mm-hmm. in some way, Play with them. Okay. how she felt that that was, that was draining her. That was making her not a good mother. And then she heard this advice that really what kids need is like two 20 minute sessions of 100% engagement with you. You don't have your phone. You're not doing laundry. You're not watching TV, but you are 100% engaged with them. That 40 minutes, she was saying, I don't know if this is true, that 40 minutes is really all the young kids need of your undivided attention. That's not to say for the rest of the day you leave them, but say for the rest of the day, they're helping you with household Mm -hmm. chores or they're entertaining themselves. And I started thinking about that. I'm not sure where I land, I genuinely love like talking to my kids and reading to my kids and playing with my kids. And so I'm not sure if I entirely ag- agree with her point, but I did think about the fact, like I had such a present and loving mom and we still have a great relationship. I don't really remember though, like my parents constantly entertaining me, you know, like oh, yeah. giving me games to play or being on the floor and like or doing these playing intricate dolls crafts. And, yes, which yeah. I'm not saying that that's bad, but I do wonder mm. if there is some value in kids just like coming along for the ride with us and what we're doing around the house mm. or in work and also entertaining themselves. I, my kid, my older kids have just gotten to the age to where I can like be like, let them out the backyard and be like, go with God, like have fun. And they, I mean, it's childproof the backyard. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 <laughs> totally. Our, our backyard is very childproof, but you also have to be okay with some things. Right. I have to be okay with them digging in the dirt and I picking have, up slugs. Yes. And I have been okay with that because I want, that's like creative for them. And so I have kind of let go of this pressure to constantly personally entertain mm. Even when I am present with them, if you let your kids, I think, get bored enough, they will figure out oh, what 100%. to do. Oh, 100%. So I don't know what you think oh, about I all think that. I think you're spot on. I, th- I I mean, the whole like 20 minutes twice a day, I mean, that might be a useful rule of thumb for people who need sort of yeah. to think in those terms. And like, I need to know, I need a marching order for how to do this exactly. But I completely agree. I mean, I'm, I'm one of eight. I grew up, we had this big backyard and we were just rough and tumble. And yes, there were moments where my mother was like reading to me or like really yes. engaging with me, of course. Yes. But she was busy, very busy with the household. She was educating us. She was starting a school to educate more children. She was doing all of this stuff. And I never felt that she wasn't engaged with me or nurturing yeah. me, but I wasn't being like led the gamut of the craft tape. You know, it was, it was a different. Yeah. And I think people have different personalities. Children have different personalities. And so there's not a one size fits all with a lot of this, but the principles are the same as getting to know your kid. What does your kid need? Um, providing enough independence and exploration and playtime that's not dependent on you. And then doing your responsibilities as a parent to create the environment and to really have service of others too beyond even your immediate family and your family's a part of that. I remember some of the best advice I received and it wasn't that long ago. It was maybe four or five years ago. I was at a speaking event and I met this amazing couple who was a missionary couple from some, I forget which African company country, but they started this hospital in an area where there had been no healthcare services. They did these incredible feats. Mm -hmm. They had three young children during the time. They did this together. They're both doctors with very young children and I remember asking the woman, because the, the sons are like super, they're grown up and they're super good. They're, 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 there's not yeah. like the sad missionary kid story of like they went off the deep end and had a horrible, yeah. I mean, I know there's obviously tragic stories that are not everybody, yeah. necessarily the parents' fault, but the point is they had this really healthy family from what I understood. So I was asking her specifically, how did you do that? You built institutions in a foreign country 
with very limited resources and support. And you seem to have really been successful in raising this family. How did you do it? And she said, she used this phrase. She said, I had them sit at my feet. Mm. She brought them with her. Mm. She took them with her. And I think in that culture she was in, it's a very accepted, accepting culture of children just being everywhere. Yeah. So I think that that helped, but they were a part of her work Mm -hmm. and she taught them. She took maybe that 20 minutes multiple times a day to stop and teach them something and engage with them. She made sure their needs were met. She made sure they were safe, that she had some structures for them, but they were part of the family project. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea that there's a family project that each family is called to primarily help each other get to heaven, you know, like help each other glorify God. But then as part of that, serve the people around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Bring other people with you. And I think when we have toddlers, sometimes it feels so impossible because toddlers are going through something. (laughs) They're always going through something because, I mean, it's just just natural. Yeah, they're like trying to be independent, which is Mm -hmm. great, but they don't realize how dependent they really are. And so there are a lot of emotions that are tied to that and learning obedience and all, Mm -hmm. all of those things. But I've learned like something in parenting that the quickest, uh, the thing that takes the longest is usually the right thing. Not Mm. always, but is usually the right thing. The quicker, easier thing to do when your kids are unruly or when your kids are like, oh my gosh, like they're not obeying or they're going through this whiny stage or whatever is to satiate them with a screen. Or to, I don't know, do just like the quickest fixed thing to Hand not them take a them cookie. with you. Yeah. <laughs> Put yeah. them in and, front of a movie or give them right. a cookie or and I'm whatever. Not saying yeah. That's always wrong by yeah. any means. Of course, no, there are times there are times yeah. that we do that. Or the easiest thing is to not take them with you. Like the easiest thing right. is to not include them. Including in work stuff and mission yes. stuff. Because they're gonna they yeah. are going to slow you down. It would be easier for you to do it by yourself. Mm. It would be easier to not include them in things. It would be easier to not teach them things. It would be easier to not make them do hard things. It would be easier to not let them make mistakes. It would be easier to not get through that difficult period before they figure out how to entertain themselves. Like that period of boredom where they're constantly asking you to like do something for them. It would be easier to just curtail that and give them something easy to do that distracts them like a phone game or something. Like the thing that takes longer in parenting I've realized is typically the right thing Mm. to do. And that is so true of what you just said of like inviting kids into your mission Um, And discipling your kids. Like it's so easy to think when your kids are toddlers and it seems like they don't understand things, that there's no use in praying with them. There's no use in reading the Bible to them. There's no use in trying to get them to memorize these things because they can't. Or, you know, they're being silly every time I try to pray with them or I might read them the Bible, they act like they understand it and they turn around and hit their sister, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Um, But then one day you pray and then your four-year-old takes over and starts praying, and yeah. you're like, "Fruit! It's amazing. There's fruit. I didn't see the fruit, but there it is. They know um, the prayers that you've been saying that you're not yes. even sure they were paying attention to. Yes, and it's that's an incredible like, experience when they start yes. to say the words back to you, and then they ask the questions. Like our four-year-old is asking all these theological questions every yes. night. Yes, yes, that's fruit. It's beautiful. That's fruit. Yeah. And all those difficult mm. periods, all that time." where you were like, nope, I'm going to do the harder thing right now. I'm going to do the more difficult thing. I'm going to do the longer bedtime routine, even though I'm tired. That includes the Bible reading. That includes the Mm. praying. Because even if I don't see the fruit right now, I know that God is going to be faithful in that. Um, Yeah. So I'm I'm not acting like we do that perfectly, but that is something that I've realized over time. And that takes a lot of self-control too, Mm. Uh, especially if you're busy doing something else and your kids are like demanding something instead of, you know, snapping or instead of being like, just fine, you can have what you want. And dying to our own immediate priorities yes. in the moment. Exactly. I, I, I have to like, I've been learning new lessons of patience that I didn't even know I needed to learn because everything, I was patient before kids. Oh yeah. Nothing bothered me. When you and have nothing to wait on, it's really easy to be patient. Yeah. But now learning, I, I, I what you just said, it's so profound and true that taking that time and sacrificing other things for the sake of that time is really that what is parenting yeah. that is parenting right reason number 1000 to have kids is that it makes you like it sanctifies you mm-hmm. like it makes you a better more compassionate more patient more self-controlled person like you learn so much about regulating your own emotions 
and how Mm -hmm. to like communicate clearly, how to manage a team, how to multitask. Like there are just so many things that you learn in being a mom that I don't think corporate America can teach you in 20 years. I do want to ask, because you mentioned you're working with your husband now. Yeah. You've always worked with him. Obviously we work with our husbands, but professionally, I mean, this is like the family business, the family mission more. You're on the same team, 100% with like the structure he's yeah. managing now sounds like part of your business and your work. What, what inspired that? How has that been? Yeah. So he has always been from the very beginning, like we have always been in it together and he has, I mean, we are like such a supporter of each other, but he has always 100% believed in me mm-hmm. and seen things in me, like even before I started my blog or anything and people can tune into the live action exclusive to that we did together to hear about that mm-hmm. whole story. But he has just always like led me and guided me, but really encouraged me along the way. And he has always been He's a decision maker for our family, like the big decisions, but now in like a professional capacity, him helping me with just discernment of like what opportunities to take and what not to take. But even down to like, I mean, we talk about, again, always have, but now he just has more time to do it. Um, Talk about like, wait, should I wade into this Twitter controversy? Should I respond to this person? And that doesn't mean he doesn't micromanage me. Like, you know, he trusts me completely, but I just like want his wisdom on those things. But now it takes a much more like, um, I guess involved form and in that he is handling a lot of the communication, a lot of decision-making that I just didn't have the capacity and time to do. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for it. And I never have to worry about anything. Like I never, I just trust him completely. So what's the plan? Where, where are you going with this new arrangement? Hmm. I, well, you know, we don't know where, I mean, I'm going to continue doing my podcast mm-hmm. and we've got an event coming up this year that I haven't even like officially mm-hmm. announced yet, but, um, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be in Texas. So there will be more details of that coming out soon. And we've got some different plans in the works of how we want to just continue doing what I do, but in different forms, mm-hmm. bringing clarity and courage to a world that is confused and chaotic and cowardly and, um, yeah, and continuing to partner with people like you and hopefully being bringing truth to a very truthless world. I love it. Well, excited to cheer you on. The Thank best you. is yet you to come. Too. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to join our Patreon and our locals communities. That's how we help the show grow and reach more people. You can do that at the link in the bio. Thanks so much for all of your support. It means the world to me and we will see you next time.